Welcome to Hebraic Insights in the Gospels. Join us every Sabbath on Zion Road Radio for a look at the life, deeds, and words of Yeshua Messiah and his followers. From the Torah-centric Hebraic perspective, they were originally lived and written in. Stand at the crossroads and look. Ask for the ancient paths. Ask where the good way is. And walk in it. And you find rest for your soul. Does God see us as and treat us like his children? In what ways are we all like children? How can being childlike have a positive impact on our spiritual walk? How can being childlike have a negative impact on our spiritual walk? What does the high calling require? Can you be called to endure difficulty? What should we do if that happens? And what example did Messiah set for us when that happened with him? How does God deal with fear in his children? Why does God tell us both the pleasant truths and the unpleasant truths? Does the fact that you're spiritually immature in at least one area or another mean that you're a bad believer or that God doesn't love you as much? What helps us to grow into mature sons and daughters of God? And why should we follow God closely in the way that he's leading us? Stay tuned for Eliyahu ben David's insight on these questions and more in Mark chapter 10. And now, here's today's scripture portion. Mark chapter 10. He, that is Messiah, arose from there and came into the borders of Judea and beyond the Jordan. Multitudes came together to him again. As he usually did, he was again teaching them. Pharisees came to him, testing him, and asked him, Is it legal for a man to divorce his wife? He answered, What did Moses command you? They said, Moses allowed a certificate of divorce to be written and to divorce her. But Yeshua said to them, For your hardness of heart he wrote you this commandment, but from the beginning of creation Elohim made them male and female. For this cause a man will leave his father and mother and will join to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore Elohim has joined together, let no man separate. In the house, his disciples asked him again about the same matter. He said to them, Whoever divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery against her. If a woman herself divorces her husband and marries another, she commits adultery. They were bringing to him little children, that he should touch them. But the disciples rebuked those who were bringing them. But when Yeshua saw it, he was moved with indignation and said to them, Allow the little children to come to me. Don't forbid them, for the kingdom of Elohim belongs to such as these. Most certainly, I tell you, whoever will not receive the kingdom of Elohim like a little child, he will in no way enter into it. He took them in his arms and blessed them, laying his hands on them. As he was going out into the way, One ran to him, knelt before him, and asked him, Good rabbi, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? Yeshua said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good except one, Elohim. You know the commandments. Do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not give false testimony, do not defraud, honor your father and mother. He said to him, Rabbi, I have observed all these things from my youth. Yeshua, looking at him, loved him, and said to him, One thing you lack. Go, 
Sell whatever you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. And come, follow me, taking up the cross. But his face fell at that saying, and he went away sorrowful, for he was one who had great possessions. Yeshua looked around and said to his disciples, How difficult it is! for those who have riches to enter into the kingdom of Elohim. The disciples were amazed at his words, but Yeshua answered again, Children, how hard it is for those who trust in riches to enter into the kingdom of Elohim. It is easier for a camel to go through a needle's eye than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of Elohim. They were exceedingly astonished, saying to him, Then who can be saved? Yeshua, looking at them, said, With men it is impossible, but not with Elohim. For all things are possible with Elohim. Peter began to tell him, Behold, we have left all and have followed you. Yeshua said, Most certainly, I tell you, there is no one who has left house, or brothers, or sisters, or father, or mother, or wife, or children, or land, for my sake, and for the sake of the good news. But he will receive one hundred times more now in this time, houses, brothers, sisters, mothers, children, and land, with persecutions and in the age to come eternal life. But many who are first will be last, and the last first. They were on the way going up to Jerusalem, and Yeshua was going in front of them. And they were amazed, and those who followed were afraid. He again took the twelve and began to tell them the things that were going to happen to him. Behold, we are going up to Jerusalem. The Son of Man will be delivered to the chief priests and the scribes. They will condemn him to death and will deliver him to the Gentiles. They will mock him, spit on him, scourge him, and kill him. On the third day, he will rise again. Jacob and John, the sons of Zebedee, came near to him, saying, Rabbi, we want you to do for us whatever we will ask. He said to them, What do you want me to do for you? They said to him, Grant to us that we may sit one at your right hand and one at your left hand in your glory. But Yeshua said to them, You don't know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink and be immersed with the immersion that I am immersed with? They said to him, We are able. Yeshua said to them, You shall indeed drink the cup that I drink, and you shall be immersed with the immersion that I am immersed with. But to sit at my right hand and at my left hand is not mine to give, but for whom it has been prepared. When the ten heard it, they began to be indignant towards Jacob and John. Yeshua summoned them and said to them, You know that they who are recognized as rulers over the nations master it over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them. But it shall not be so among you. But whoever wants to become great among you shall be your servant. Whoever of you wants to become first among you shall be bondservant of all. For the Son of Man also came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. They came to Jericho. As he went out from Jericho with his disciples and a great multitude, the son of Timaeus Bartimaeus, a blind beggar, was sitting by the road. When he heard that it was Yeshua the Nazarene, he began to cry out and say, Yeshua, you son of David, have mercy on me. Many rebuked him that he should be quiet, but he cried out much more, 
You son of David, have mercy on me. Yeshua stood still and said, Call him. They called the blind man, saying to him, Cheer up, get up, he is calling you. He, casting away his cloak, sprang up and came to Yeshua. Yeshua asked him, What do you want me to do for you? The blind man said to him, Rabboni, that I may see again. Yeshua said to him, Go your way, your faith has made you well. Immediately he received his sight and followed Yeshua in the way. And now here's Eliyahu ben David with insight on that portion. Stand at the crossroads and look Ask for the ancient paths Ask where the good way is And walk in it Greetings, friends. You know, each one of us really is a child at heart a child of the living God. And as every good parent, he loves his children, and he wants to bless us. So we're going to see that in our message tonight in Mark chapter 10. Well, I want to share a little bit about this theme, each one his child. And before I do... I just want to mention Mark chapter 10, 1 through 12. And we aren't doing that part of Mark 10 tonight because we've done already a pretty in-depth teaching on marriage and divorce, which is what this is, where the same material is covered in the book of Matthew. Isn't it a wonderful thing to know that each of us is his child. You know, it's a special thing, really, being a child. A good parent may have a number of children, but the best parents do not treat all their children the same. It's one of those things that you hear from people, oh, you need to treat all your children the same. No. You don't want to do that. Because if you have several children, you already know that each of your children is very different from the others. And each of them has their own personality, their own character, and their own needs. And this really requires treating each of them as an individual and uniquely focusing what you have to give your child on each individual child. Well, if the best parents do that here in the earth, how much more our Father in heaven? This is how he deals with each of us. Yes, the same rules apply to everybody, and yet he deals with us in a very unique way. Here in the book of Mark, Yeshua shows us how highly he regards children. Allow the little children to come to me. Whoever will not receive the kingdom of Elohim like a little child, he will in no way enter into it. So not only does he highly regard actual little children, and believe me, he does make himself known to them. For me, it was before I could read that I had a relationship with my Creator. And There's a lot of other people that can tell you the same thing. He can make himself known to the little children. But beyond that, he really requires that each one of us who would enter into the kingdom in intimacy with him must come to him as a little child. Now, that's not as hard as it might seem, because you know what? In a lot of ways, we're already like little children. And some of that is good, and what he's talking about, 
and some of it is not so good because when we grow up, there's a lot of things that need to change. Let's face it, we can't stay children forever. And as I go through this tonight, what I want to look at here is how Yeshua treats us as children. And I want to look at how the people that he's dealing with in Mark 10 manifest traits that we often see in children. Children often see things differently than their parents or adults or Messiah. So the two ideas kind of go together, just a little different focus on each of them to help us understand these verses better. Well, we have the rich young ruler, and we're not going to rehash the whole story here, but what he told Messiah was that he had observed all the commandments from his youth. Now, we're talking there about the commandments that are part of the covenant of Israel. And this we call the Ten Commandments. And he had been observing them all of his life. And the next thing it says is Yeshua, looking at him, loved him. Now, he was the man that wanted to obey God, and he knew that to love God meant to keep his commandments. And Yeshua looked at him when he said that, I think believed him, and loved him because he was a commandment keeper. I don't think we want to skip over that really quick. <laughs> I think we want to realize that in this story, that Yeshua felt love for him when he heard he was a commandment keeper. Now, as we go on, we see that Yeshua is asking even more of him. But let's not skip this part. You know, many places we find Yeshua saying, well, you should have done that, which is keeping a commandment, but you should also do this other thing. And this is kind of like that statement. Yes, you should keep the commandments, and that's what Yeshua said. And he loved him because of that. When children obey, they give their parents an opportunity to express their love for their kids. When children don't obey, what happens? Their parents love them still, right? But it does create a barrier. The same thing is true of us as adults. When we fail to obey Yahweh and his word, he loves us just the same, but it creates a barrier where we don't fully receive his love. You know, it's us, the barriers in us when we don't obey. So just saying what this man was doing right, we need to do right. Keep the commandments. But now let's continue on. Yeshua, looking at him, loved him and said to him, one thing you lack, go sell whatever you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and come follow me, taking up the cross. I believe that Yeshua was telling him, you have a greater opportunity here. You can move beyond where what you've done is going to take you, and you can be in the kingdom with me. This is a higher calling. But what does this require? Giving everything. The high calling requires more than simply commandment keeping. It requires total self-sacrifice. When it says, follow me, taking up the cross, it means exactly what it says, that we must adopt the attitude and purpose of Yeshua Messiah, even going to the cross if called to, and certainly being willing to carry our own cross in our life, whatever that may be, for the sake of the kingdom. 
This is a requirement of the high calling. And this rich young man could have been part of that, but that's not what happened. His face fell at that saying, and he went away sorrowful, for he was one who had great possessions. No, I'm not going to give up what I've got for whatever it is you're talking about. A lot of people make that choice. A lot of people, like children, think they can hang on to all the marbles. You can't. You can't hang on to all the marbles. You can't take all the cookies. Have the things of this world and have the kingdom too. Doesn't work like that. And when a lot of people learn that, then they go away sorrowful like this rich young man. Well, Yeshua here points out how difficult it is for those who have riches to enter into the kingdom of Elohim. Now, in that world as in ours, it seems like everybody wants to have riches. And it's kind of assumed that the people that have riches must be the smartest people. They must be somehow the best people because that's how they're treated by everybody. So this is kind of a shocking statement the first time you hear it. That's how the disciples felt. They were amazed at his words. And so Yeshua answered again, Children, how hard is it for those who trust in riches to enter into the kingdom of Elohim? You know what? What we're talking about is really elementary school stuff. They're marveling about it because it's the first time they learned about it. But he's talking to them as children. You know, a lot of the misconceptions that we have are simply because perhaps we have not reached a level of spiritual maturity where we know simple things. What we're talking about here is a very simple thing, yet they were amazed at it. And so he calls them children. And he warns them that trusting in riches could keep them from the kingdom. Riches are very elusive. You know, there are benefits to riches, but it's very, very limited. You know, every billionaire in the world is going to die. They can hire the best doctors. They can go to the best hospitals. They can have people monitoring them 24 hours a day. But when their time comes, they're going to die. Riches are limited as to what they can do for you. And what happens when they do die? They will stand before the judgment seat of the Almighty. That's going to happen with every person. I don't want to go there having to say and admit, oh, riches were my God. Don't you do that either. Well, Peter felt kind of good about this. And kind of like a kid in class who raises his hand, he says, oh, we're doing that. And I kind of like that. Because, you know, he was taking pleasure in the fact that they were doing something Messiah said. That's a very childlike response. And I like it, and I think that's what I should do. I think that's what we should all do. We should all be happy when we're doing what Messiah said, right? And 
Yeshua affirmed Peter. He said, most certainly I tell you, there's no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or land for my sake. Wow, wait a minute. Who has left? Who has left? Are you going to do that for Messiah? Leave your house? Your brothers, your sisters, your father, your mother, your wife? Wait a minute. That's not what they told me at the Christian church. Wow. Or your children? Or land for my sake and for the sake of the good news. But he will receive 100 times more. Now, in this time, houses, brothers, sisters, mothers, children, and land with persecutions, and in the age to come, eternal life. Yes, you know what? When you decide that you are going to give your whole life to Yeshua Messiah, strange things start happening, and that is challenged, and it's different in different people's lives, right? But Sometimes it's the people closest to us and the things we value the most that end up in a position, okay, it's either them or him, or it or him. And when we're in that position, what do we do? Do we do what other people tell us to do, or do we do what he tells us to do? It's really something to think about. But, you know, if we are put in that position where we need to make that choice, when we choose him, he promises that we will receive a hundred times more in this life. Now, he's not saying we'll receive house for house, brother for brother, sister for sister, like that. He's just saying that we will receive a hundred times more. Now, what does he mean when he says that? I don't think he means that we're going to become wealthy in the worldly sense, because he just talked to us about riches and told us what a snare that is. So is he going to dump a big snare into our life? I think he's talking about the real riches. Let's say you do lose your friends and you even lose your family to follow him. Well, aren't you going to receive many more in the household of faith, brothers and sisters and mothers and fathers in a spiritual way that'll totally fill up your life and fulfill you? And I can tell you, from my own experience in life, that's exactly what happens. You don't really ever lose anything following him. You cannot outgive God. Believe me, trust me on that. Whatever you give, you're going to receive so much more. And it's going to be beyond what you can imagine right now. It's not going to be the same as what you're thinking. You know, it's not like the prosperity gospel where you believe for a Cadillac, and that's what you get. That is so stupid, isn't it? And childlike and not in a good way. Your father wants to give you spiritual blessings to fill up your heart, fill up your life, because he loves you so much. You know, it reminds me a little bit about a kid that loves ice cream. You know, you as his parent, you could just shovel that ice cream towards him. You could just give him a quart, give him a gallon, give him five gallons, you know. You're not going to do that. Because you love your kid, right? You're not going to make your kid sick by giving him too much of something he'd love to get. 
Your Father in heaven loves you. He wants to bless you with real things, even, even if you might not understand fully what they are until you get them. And that's really fun, too, by the way. The surprise of the spiritual blessings and what they really are and their real effect in your life. It's so cool. It is so cool. And yeah, along with that, what do you get? Persecutions. See, that's what he's got in mind when he's talking about having to give up your relatives, your family, your friends, your stuff. He's talking about persecutions. This is persecution to have this pushed upon you. And you know, you can stop that persecution by just going along with the world. Persecution stops in an instant. But if you continue in that way, as his child, you value him first, yeah, you're going to have persecutions. However, in the age to come, eternal life. And as he says, many who are first will be last and the last first. Many of those people that he's talking about, the famous, the wealthy, the people who are first now, they'll be last in the kingdom. And some of the people you never thought of are going to be first in the kingdom because they have a servant's heart because they love him. That's pretty awesome. Well, here's something that's interesting. They were on the way going up to Jerusalem. Now, wait a minute. Hadn't he already told them twice that when he went to Jerusalem, they were going to kill him? Now, they're on the way going up to Jerusalem. Not only that, Yeshua was going in front of them. He's leading them. It's almost like he can't wait to get there. And they were amazed. It is kind of amazing, isn't it? Didn't anybody tell him that couldn't be God? Isn't that what they tell you? If you're called towards something difficult... Don't they say, oh, that couldn't be God because God wouldn't want something for you that was painful like that or that was suffering? Haven't you had people tell you that? Wait a minute. He called his own son to die for us, to suffer for us. Do you think he might call you to suffer? for his name's sake, possibly even to give your life? It could happen. It is consistent with who God is. Yeshua knew it was true. So he's out in front. He's wanting to do the will of God in his life, even when it's hard. You know the way I think of it? For the righteous, there's one path. Sometimes that path will take you to the highest mountain. I love it up there. Sometimes that path will take you to the deepest valley. When it's going into the valley, don't turn left or right away. David said, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, thou art with me. Stay on the path, whether it's a mountain path, whether it becomes death valley. 
stay on the path because of where that path ends, which is in the kingdom with Yeshua. Well, that's what Yeshua was modeling for us, and they were amazed to see that in him. And it says those who followed were afraid. That is what kids would do, isn't it? When you see the big boogeyman, don't you get afraid? That's where the disciples were at, by the way, through all of this. They were very immature, spiritually speaking. So they were afraid. And then it says, he again took the twelve and began to tell them the things that were going to happen to him. He didn't want them being afraid of some nebulous thing that they couldn't nail down. He wanted to tell them exactly what was going to happen. And that's the best way to deal with fear. You know, what you see here is the way he's dealing with the fear in them is he's showing them exactly what the truth is. And the truth is the way to deal with fear. If you've got something coming up in your life that's difficult, something you need to do, you know, the childlike thing to do is run away. The Messiah-like thing to do is to come to grips with your fear, look at the truth, and move forward in faith. That's what he's modeling for them. Well, then we have this. Jacob and John, the sons of Zebedee, came near to him saying, Rabbi, we want you to do for us whatever we will ask. I think that's interesting. What they're wanting from Messiah is for him to promise he's going to do it before he knows what it is. Isn't that just like a kid? Kind of like a naughty kid in a way. A kid that wants something that they know they shouldn't have. So they try to get their parent to agree to it before they tell them. And Messiah is not falling for it. He doesn't say, oh, yeah, I'll give you whatever you want. Apparently, he's not like a lot of parents today. Whatever the kids ask for, they get it, right? No, that wasn't him. He said, what do you want me to do for you? No, I'm not giving you a blank check here. Tell me what you want. Very honest. Basically, they were saying, we want to be your favorites. Isn't that just what kids want? To be the favorite? Well, that's probably not going to happen. And the way Yeshua dealt with this was not to placate them. It's to tell them, no, they can't have that. Parents can learn a lot from the way Messiah dealt with his disciples. Well, then what? The other ten disciples, they heard about this. What do you expect them to do? They said, what? They got to you before we did. Isn't that predictable? Isn't that predictable that the other disciples would resent this? Why did these guys think about that? You know, it is true. Kids are selfish sometimes. But a lot of times, kids just think about what they want. And they don't always think about how that's going to affect other people. Immature adults 
are like that too. In and outside of the congregation. It's part of immaturity to be like that. And you see, Messiah didn't castigate them for being immature. Not in this case, in none of the other cases. He just told them what the truth is. This is really the only way to help people grow. Tell them what the truth is. That can't happen because, you know? This is what Messiah said. Whoever of you wants to become first among you shall be bondservant of all. Now, wait a minute. When I asked, that's not what I wanted. I wanted glory, right? I wanted to be elevated in glory. Nobody said anything about being a bondservant. He's telling them, you know, you need to rethink this, right? For the Son of Man also came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Now, I think under the circumstances, that is a profound statement. Because here he is on his way to Jerusalem to give his life for many. And here he's pointing to himself as an example of the things he's saying. And this is what you find about him. The walk matches the talk. It's not, you should do this, but I'm going to do that. He walked it out. He was walking ahead of them in more than one way. This is why, it's why this study that we're doing through the Gospels of Yeshua's life and his words is so important for us because it helps to dispel any childish thinking that we still have. And you know, we all do in certain areas of our life. We have some childish thinking. And as we look at him and what he did and what he said, and we learn these truths, it helps us to grow. There is nothing like the Word to help us to grow as a person, to be mature sons and daughters of the living God. Well, finally, we get to the blind man. And I would like to mention a few things. I don't have all the verses here, but the blind man addressed Yeshua as Yeshua the Nazarene, and he called him the son of David twice. And what that means is he is appealing to Yeshua on the basis that Yeshua was the leader of the house of David. In other words, as an Israelite, he understood from the scriptures about the Davidic covenant. And he had faith in it. And he had faith that Yahweh promised that he would provide shepherds for Israel. He didn't say Messiah. People generally didn't understand yet that Yeshua was the Messiah. But they did know that he was of the house of David. They did know he was a Nazarene. And so did this man, and he appealed to Yeshua on that basis. And Yeshua acknowledged that. He said, what do you want me to do for you? And the blind man said, Rabboni, that I may see again. Well, if you were blind, what would you want? Very simple, that I may see again. And Yeshua said to him, go your way, your faith has made you well. Now, no spitting and making mud here, no kinds of special things, not even laying on hands or touching him, touching his garment, nothing. Messiah simply said, go your way, your faith has made you well. 
In the midst of that sentence, no doubt, this man's eyes opened. Faith is very powerful. And nobody, it seems, can express faith as much as a child. You see this. This man had a childlike faith. It says, immediately he received his sight and followed Yeshua in the way. This is the greatest thing. You know, kids, when they see somebody that does something good for them, you know what they want to do? They want to follow that person. Sometimes they'll follow them right around. That's what we want to be like with Messiah. We want to acknowledge these wonderful, great things he has done for us. And especially when we receive that special touch in our life to meet our personal needs, to meet our spiritual needs. When we receive that, we need to follow him even more closely in the way. Because why? Because he loves each one as his child. He really treats each one as his child. And that's just such an amazing thing, such a beautiful thing. You have been listening to Hebraic Insights in the Gospels. The earlier teaching mentioned at the beginning of today's program, where Messiah discusses marriage in Matthew chapter 5, is Hebraic Insights in the Gospels, podcast episode 3, entitled, Messiah Reveals the Heart of the Torah, Part 1. To listen to it, search for Hebraic Insights in the Gospels in your favorite podcasting platform, or go to zion.org at T-S-I-Y-O-N dot O-R-G. Further teachings and study materials on keeping the commandments, the high calling, enduring hardship, putting God first, God is our Father, the family of God, marriage, service, spiritual maturity, spiritual growth, and the kingdom, along with many other related topics, can all be found at our membership site, Zion Tabernacle. Sign up is free. Just go to zion.net. That's T-S-I-Y-O-N dot N-E-T. New programs on the Gospels will be airing every Sabbath on Zion Road Radio. Tune in next Shabbat to learn more from Hebraic Insights in the Gospels. Shabbat Shalom. Would you like to hear more of Eliyahu's teachings? Do you have a question or prayer request? Would you like to get in touch with one of our volunteers for help? Do you just want to know more about Eliyahu ben David and Zion Ministry? Then visit our website at zion.org where you can listen to more teachings from Eliyahu ben David straight from the homepage of our website. Check out our books, DVDs, internet videos, and other social media outlets. Learn more about Eliyahu and the Zion team on our About page. See what our ministry's mission is all about from the Remnant Vision page. Send a question or prayer request at our Contact Us page. Or click Join Us from the menu bar 
and learn about our community website, Zion Tabernacle. To find out more about the Zion ministry, go to zion.org. That's T-S-I-Y-O-N dot O-R-G.